The Lord be with you. Well, I'd like to welcome those who braved the ice this morning to Longview Presbyterian Church and those who are visiting with us on Zoom as well. I'm Linda Beatty, a Lutheran pastor, former hospice chaplain in the last part of my career, currently retired and serving on a multiple hundred anniversary committees because Longview turns 100, Trinity Lutheran turns 100, and the YMCA is turning 100. So we're partying all year long. And I'm excited to be here. I love coming here. If you guys were closer to my house and I didn't have other commitments, I'd be sitting there in the pew, but so it goes. And I get to lead worship because Pastor Liz and Dexter are on vacation. Well-deserved, I am certain. And they will be back to work at tomorrow. I don't know where they're coming from, so I'm hoping that they're not icy roads when they come. That's kind of scary. Um, Today is demonstrated with the lighting of the Christ candle. Jesus is the light of the world and is indeed here among us in the family of faith, warming us and filling us with the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a community of faith that is seeking Christ's way and welcoming to all people. And I am so glad each and every one of you are here in person as well as in spirit. There's a few announcements. I tell you, Liz is so organized. She had it written down three different places for me. <laughs> but glasses are important. So announcements are printed in the back part of your bulletin for upcoming events. There is, with Pastor Liz in your church family, an hour of Zoom fellowship and prayer this coming Tuesday, January 31st at 7 p.m. All you have to do is use the Zoom link on the church's website, and I've done that, and it works. Everyone is welcome, and we hope that you'll take this opportunity to build a deeper relationship with your church family. Also invited to the monthly service of healing and wholeness this coming Thursday, February 2nd at 7.30. It can be attended here in person or on Zoom. It's an hour long of song and silence and prayer, scripture reading, and candle lighting. It is such a heartfelt time. Um, my friend that I brought from New York years ago to that service still talks about it, even in New York. We just, we just spoke about it last week, as a matter of fact. Child care will be provided, and we hope to see you there. Also, you guys are partying. Movie matinee on February 11th at 1 p.m. here at the church. The movie is to be announced. I hear it's a real popular to be announced as a great movie. But it will be family friendly and we will have popcorn. So again, hope to see you there. Those are my announcements. Are there any from the congregation that have been missed? Then I invite Ron, wherever he decided to go. There you are, hi. Come forward and to lead us to, in the call of worship. Thank you so much for being here. Okay. When we seek justice for the other, when we love kindness more than ever, we live as God asks us to live. When we walk humbly through life, when we offer mercy to those who hurt us, we are the blessing God hopes we will be. When we are willing to look foolish by following Jesus, when we choose weakness rather than power, we reflect the one who is in our midst. I now invite you to rise in body or spirit for our opening hymn, number 543, God be the love to search and keep me. of sun and glow of moonlight, flash 
It's time for the kids, and guess what? You all are them. <laughs> I like that. So this is the hardest part, I think, for a pastor, is to get a kid's sermon. It takes more time than figuring out to write a bunch of stuff. But I found six little short stories with lots of meaning, and I want to share them with you. She says, Okay. Once all villagers decided to pray for rain. And on the day of the prayer, all the people gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. What do you call that? Faith. Faith. Exactly. Exactly. I like that little boy. <laughs> and when you throw a baby up, and you catch the baby, what do you call that? For <laughs> Gary, maybe they did at, at one time. But the baby giggles and laughs and is wonderful and you catch it, but what do you call that? Trust, thank you so much. And every night we go to bed without any assurance of being alive the next morning, but still we set the alarm clock to wake up. What do you call that? You guys are really good. <laughs> so we plan big things for tomorrow in spite of zero knowledge of the future. What did you say? Hubris. Hubris. That's a great word, but that's the, not the one I'm looking for. <laughs> How about confidence? Confidence, yes. We see the world suffering, but still we get married and we have children. What is that? It, you guys are whispering, I need louder voices. I don't need louder voices. Okay, it's a four letter word. Faith is more than four letters, George. Love, thank you so much, Julie, yes. It's love. We do get married, we do have children, and we do so because we love. All right. And the last short story, on an old, and, you're, and this is all for all of us, okay? Keep this in mind when you go out from this building and somebody asks you how old you are. On an old man's shirt was written a sentence, I am not 80 years old. I am sweet 16 with 64 years of experience. <laughs> That's attitude. That's attitude. And now we ask for responsive prayer. Oh, Lord God, you have brought us to this place so that we can practice our faith. We can learn once again to trust. That we continue to offer hope for the morning. That we have confidence in the day and tomorrow. That our love continues to grow. That our love continues to grow. And when we leave this place, we do so 
with gratitude of attitude. So it be. So may it be. All right. Thank you for being young at heart and getting most of the answers right. <laughs> we have a God that loves us. But sometimes I think it's important for us to take a pause and to realize that maybe we're not quite as good as we'd like to be. And so at this time, we look at a confession. I believe a lot of it is printed in your bulletin. But if we want to truly live in God's presence, if we must live as God's faithful people, then let us begin by confessing all the mistakes that we have made, the wrongs that we've done, the people that we've hurt. We begin this time of confession by naming the land our church occupies was stolen by white settlers from the Cowlitz Indian tribe. May this land acknowledgement recommit us to the work of solidarity with our indigenous neighbors. It is vital to honor those who came before us and acknowledge the long history of what is now Southwest Washington. This area has been home to ancestors of the Cowlitz Indian tribe for thousands of years. The land with its rich resources enabled the Cowlitz people to flourish and they stewarded the land with their traditional culture. Today, we must appreciate the persistence of the Cowlitz people and the important role they play in our region. As together, we steward the land for all our descendants. And we continue in prayerful confession. What have we done to you, dear God? We dishonor you every time we treat another with disrespect. We shatter your heart when we find it easier to break our word than to take the risk to keep it. We fill your ears with gossip, lies, and slanders. We speak about those around us. You are wise enough to forgive our foolishness. You are strong enough to overcome our weakness. You are loving enough to heal the hurt we cause to you and to others. And so you give us new hope and new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. What has God done for us? Shown mercy. What has God done for us? Forgiven us. This is the good news for us. We will not boast, for it is not our doing. We will give thanks to God for grace and hope. Amen. It's time to pass the peace of Christ with one another, so feel free to use sign language. We've been practicing this part of the service, I know, since I was here the last time. So please, the Lord, peace of the Lord be with each and every one of you. Thank you. Finally, thank you, Gary. Woohoo! Yes. Hallelujah. Peace of Christ be with you all. Very nice. And also with you, Marilyn. Thank you. Peace of Christ. Peace of Christ, everyone. people. Yeah. Um, Ron, I'm inviting you to come forward to do your thing. Please pray with me. Send your spirit, God of love, to open our hearts and minds to the words of your prophets and of your beloved child, Jesus, who walked among us. May your word transform our daily lives. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Micah, the sixth <clears throat> chapter, verses one to eight. Um, it's kind of an unusual reading in that its setting is kind of a metaphorical courthouse where God is both 
prosecutor and judge challenging his people who have failed him uh, in their trust, trustworthiness and faithfulness. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent you before Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him. And what happened to Shittim and to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, and it will be very familiar. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will <clears throat> inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Somebody Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive said, mercy. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you. When people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted you, the prophets who came before you. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts bring us to action as stewards of the living God. Amen. Oops, push the button. Did it work? Yes, okay. There's all these things I don't know about, you know, so whew, thank you. Okay. Requirements. I mean, that's kind of what we're talking about first off. The resounding question before us this morning is not going to be about the blessedness of everything and everybody, but rather I'm taking Micah 6, 8. It talks about requirements. So the resounding question I want to pose before you this morning is, what does the Lord require of you? And it does seem to be a question I'm going to say that most of us wake up to in the morning, but we phrase it like, what do I have to do today? 
But hopefully when we answer that question, it's overshadowed by our goal to do what God would want us to do in the course of that day. Requirements are not new. They follow us every day of our life and throughout our whole life. We have to pass certain tests in order to get our driver's license, right? One can't make a pineapple upside down cake unless you have the required ingredients. We're required to wear a mask whether we go to a doctor's office or a nursing home and here at worship, except for the speaker before the microphone, I'm told. And if you want to vote, if you want your absentee ballot to be right, you're required to make the mark with the right colored ink, and then you have to sign it, then you have to put it into an envelope, and then you've got to get that envelope to the right ballot box by 12 p.m. on the second Tuesday of November, and if you want your voice to be counted, right? We're required to slow down in a school zone. Requirements every day range from the mundane to implementation of safety standards. Requirements are not new. And they weren't new to the people that Micah is writing about this morning. People for centuries have rules and regulations and recipes to follow in order to get the right outcome. Micah was one of the 12 minor prophets. Now he's only minor because he didn't write much. Has nothing to do with what he said or the quality and how important his words were. It's just that he and the other 11 didn't write volumes like Jeremiah and Isaiah. His words are very similar to the contemporaries writing at that time, like Hosea and parts of Isaiah and the little prophet Amos. They were trying to give Israel a wake up call. Israel had just experienced 40 years of prosperity, but it was coming to an end. And they're standing there saying, hey, wake up, take note. What have you done? What are you gonna do? Like everyone else who has moments of being, life is bliss and it's wonderful, we tend to ignore God. We tend to put God aside and forget that there is something greater that has maybe implemented some of this good stuff in our life. We drift away because like we spent all last year with Luke talking about the good stuff, that's pretty temporal. We forget God. And history continues to repeat itself, again, even in our own lives. When are we more inclined to turn to God or even to each other to help? It's when we actually need help or when we think that our world is starting to crumble around us. Micah's words echo throughout history. What does the Lord require of you? Well, guess what? In, chapter, in the verse 8, he gives us the answer. I know, isn't that exciting? <clears throat> First, to do justice. To do justice. What does that look like? Now, Ron could probably tell us a whole lot for hours about what justice looks like, but I, in my little niche over here, I'm going to just say in part that justice is working for the little people of our society and our world, of working for the widow, the fatherless, the orphans, the poor, the hungry, the stranger, the weak, the oppressed, so that everybody gets their fair share. There's some kind of fairness or justice, if you will, among all of us. And that's a really strong theme amongst all the prophets. And I think the last time I was here, I actually got a chance to quote Amos, where he said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Those words are pretty easy to remember, but I think they're kind of hard for us to implement and actually make it happen in our daily lives. What does the Lord require of you to do justice? Love kindness. Mm. Most of us know what kindness looks like. 
compassion, sympathy, gentleness, benevolence, helpfulness. And we should see those things every single day, whether we're the giver of it or we're the recipient. You have members in this congregation that have shown me kindness, and I asked Julie's permission, but Julie Lipke has shown me how to use an air fryer. That's pretty cool. And she's shown other people in this congregation and in the community how to cook. That's kindness. And then we have Darcy. Darcy invites me to every single event you have. I feel so wanted and welcome to be here. She also helps with technology issues too, so I give you thanks for that. And Diana Spring that we lost this last week, what a great soul that was. Every time I came to this congregation, she would always greet me with a smile and make me feel welcome. You guys know what kindness is all about. Kindness, mercy, gentleness. The ingredient that God requires from his disciples is fundamental human kindness to family, to friends, work associates, classmates, and strangers. And that shouldn't be too difficult a requirement to implement in our life, right? The question still is, what does God require of you? I want to step aside just a second. I hope you were mindful that the requirement that Micah is alluding to isn't a ticket to get to heaven. Okay? Because God's grace and love are not earned, but they're freely given. So rather the requirements Micah is inviting us to consider are those things that we would willingly do because of what God has given to us, like maybe Israel's 40 years of prosperity, instead of taking it all for granted and somehow turn their gratitude into what has been done to things that are important to the rest of the community, to do justice, to love kindness, and lastly, to walk humbly with your God. I tend to be goal-directed, so my life is sometimes on full throttle. And to walk implies slow. Walk implies measured. Walking is the opposite of running. Walking is slow, deliberate pace, and we're to do so humbly. So when we walk, we are not walking full of ourselves or preoccupied to our end game, but more as a meditative gait as we listen and we learn from the God who is always there with us. Humility is sacrificing yourself to listen to the needs of others and to the desires of God. And, oh, that's pretty hard when one's life is full speed ahead. It's hard to listen for that still small voice or that gentle nudge of the divine. Humility is the art of listening to God whereby we forget our busyness of our own mind and the moment, and we actually listen to what God is saying. And sometimes it's through the word, like we are this morning, taking pause and trying to figure out, what does this mean for me? Micah writes, to walk humbly with your God. Second person pronoun, your. Your God belongs to you. And it's not that God is your possession, but that your God is personal to you. Your God is the one who made you. Your God who walks with you every step 
of every day. You take. That's how intimate God is, your God is, with you. The big question this morning is, what does God require of you? And the answer is, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. Pixie Lighthouse is a Choctaw native poet and author. And as God would have it, I read a piece of her writing that put flesh onto these words of Micah and that question. And I want to share with you some of that because copyright laws, I can't copy it, you know, and I can't say the whole thing because we're on Zoom. But I want you to hear how she fleshes out doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with your God. And when I do, because she's writing it for herself, she uses the personal pronoun, I, me, my. And I would invite you when I say those personal pronouns, insert your own name in that prayer. It's a technique that I've used for decades, especially when reading the psalm, because just like those words, your God, it makes it much more personal and not out there. For example, the Lord is Linda's shepherd. Linda shall not want. The Lord makes Linda lie down in green pastures. Can you hear the difference? It speaks to your heart. So every time I use or say the word I, me, or my in these little snippets, please put your name in to flesh out those requirements. Help me speak out for justice and a special desire fueled by a power greater than the surface comforts and the outdated systems. Let me be a troublemaker to champion those I love and care for and for those I don't know intimately who need my help. Bind me to the medicine of love. Let me affect the transformation that leads to needed change. Light the torch of revolution in my heart. Keep my motivations clean. Grant me the tools to see near and far and find me adjusting the lens often. Help me to give a leg up to the underdog, to root for the one who doesn't stand a chance. Help me to accept being unliked or misunderstood for positioning myself behind what I believe in. Orient me to inclusivity. Help me to do my part to clang the bells of freedom. And then she ends, when 10,000 are whispering, make me the one who listens. Now, I didn't give you the whole poem, but when I read it, I was nearly in tears because she really spoke to my heart and called me to action to do the things Micah has seen the Lord wants us to do. And I do believe that these things can be taken to heart. And as I've said before, maybe in your walk and in the days ahead, if you're reading the scriptures or you're reading the Psalms, you could change that first person pronoun 
to your own name, to make it in such a way that the scriptures are heartfelt to you, and they're not something that's just wrote or said forever or common or otherworldly, but they're personal. We are too inclined to be like the people Micah was writing to and preaching to, to become complacent when things are so bad that uh, then we remember, because we've already forgotten, that there is a spiritual part of our life that needs to be dealt with. And we need to acknowledge, as our first hymn said, and as Luther wrote, that God is in, with, through, and under us always. So you may not remember Pixie Lighthouse's prayer for advocacy or action, but I pray that you do remember your answer to Micah's question. What does the Lord require of you? And the answer is, do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. And so it is. Our prayer, our prayer, well, St. Augustine said if you sing, you pray twice, so I think that works. Is 418, softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling. You may take your seats. We continue in prayer, sharing our joys, concerns, and the communal prayer. You can send your chats through Zoom, um, through the prayer sheet in front of the sanctuary, which I have, but I'm happy to write more. Uh, raising your hand, we have a mic that will go around. 
At the end of each prayer, I will say, God, in your grace, and your response will be, you receive our prayers, O oh God. We will end with a prayer of silence for all those prayer concerns that feel a little too intimate to share publicly. For we know God receives those prayers and the deepest cries of our hearts. Let us pray. Lord God, as we come before you this morning with feelings of gratitude that we were here and we arrived safely, we ask your blessing upon those who have yet to travel upon these icy roads. We ask for blessings upon Pastor Liz and Pastor Dexter as they conclude their vacation and that they come home safely. May they be rejuvenated, renewed, and feel a strong call to serve you in this community as always. God, in your grace. We pray for Daryl as he is in the process of moving. Again, moving and changing and transitions in our lives can be so stressful. We trust that your presence will be with him and your angels will continue to watch over and guide him. God, in your grace. We pray for George Brito's daughter, Myra's best friend who died on Thursday. For whatever reason, he chose not to live on this earth anymore. That's a tough call for family and friends to reckon with. So I ask that you give them a sense of peace and understanding. And I pray for him, for I know he is your child. I know that you loved him and continue to love him. And may you take him to your bosom and grant him eternal peace. So our prayer for the Brito family, God in your grace. I lift up to you all who are having surgery or pending surgery or hoping to have surgery in the next week, especially Julie Lipke for her cataract. May her eyes open and may she see and may the recuperation be clean and unpainful. And may she continue to rejoice in this, the gift of sight. May all of us acknowledge that gift within ourselves. God, in your grace. I pray for the people of the Ukraine. We think about our coldness this morning. They have had months and months of ice and snow and cold. They have no food, they have no electricity. There needs to be hope, there needs to be salvation for them in so many ways. I pray for them to sustain them and to also soften the hearts of the Russian people that maybe they can see one another as brothers and sisters and know that this world is just way too small to fight over a piece of land or property or what we think is the good stuff. And let the leaders come to terms and understanding that they are there for their people and not for themselves. We are greedy, oh Lord. I'm not sure why humans are like that, but I know you can soften our hearts and you can wake us up. You did so with Paul on the road to Damascus. So I ask that all who need to be woken up to understand that this is your world and you are the one that governs it and we are here to be your stewards. They acknowledge that, receive that, that there may be peace. God, in your grace. Are there prayers from the congregation? I've asked for prayers before for my friend Mary. Uh, Mary and I worked as hospice nurses for over 20 years. Um, she's dying of cancer. Um, she's a lady who would go to mass every day of her life. And now she's worried she doesn't have the strength to do it. But they've come to her home, given her communion. And when I talked to her yesterday, she didn't say anything about how much pain she has or how weak she was, but how wonderful all the people were that were helping her. Lord God, we look to you for, again, gratitude and your grace that is being shown to Mary with the people of her congregation. May we uplift her in prayer, asking that healing of heart, mind, body, and soul be given to her this day 
that she experiences your peace now and forever. God, in your grace. First of all, I'm Robert Mumford, and uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for their offers and thankful for all the, the, the prayers that we had uh, during our bout of COVID, and we are feeling better and thankful for that. But more importantly, <clears throat> I'm thankful for um, our safe parking guests out here. Uh, last weekend, if you weren't aware, we had real problems out there of harassment and uh, actual violence um, and uh, so we were worried about this weekend and thankfully through the rest of this week we have not had any problem um, a little bit of uh, people seeming to be on observing kind of a thing that were questioned and apparently that sent the message and that has all stopped and our people are now getting good rest uh, here in our parking lot as they try to figure out how they're going to move forward. Why let the microphone get too far away? I, I'm Gary, and I think uh, we'd be uh, remiss not to have a prayer of thanksgiving for Diana Spring, uh, someone who is a dedicated educator, someone who's a dedicated member of this church, our choir directress for a long time, Someone who was quiet yet but always had a smile and a sense of uh, awareness of all of the people around her. She was always very kind. Um, so anyway, I just want to recognize her life and uh, what an important part she played in this church. So We uplift Diana Spring Ministry to us and to our hearts, and we pray for her family in their time of grief. We pray for all families who are struggling in whatever kind of situation they have. Um, I don't know about the parking lot, I don't know about the violence, but I know that does not come from you. So we pray for peace for all who are struggling, hurting God in your grace. My name is Julie. Um, prayers for people who are waiting, waiting, waiting at our southern border for our hard hearts to be opened. We uplift those who are trying to emigrate into a land that will hopefully offer them jobs, health care, peace, and freedom from fear of persecution and the threat of death not only at our southern border, but I offer all the borders that are holding refugees and taking them in and harboring them and hopefully loving them. Again, Lord, soften our hearts. God, in your grace. I'm Jan. I ask prayers for Merle and Daryl as they are over at St. Stephen's this morning talking about Opoc, which is one parish, one prisoner, and hoping that maybe they would form a team and be supportive of someone who is coming out of incarceration. So prayers for them. Awesome. Prayers for Merle and Daryl who are seeking new ministries. Uh, with the prison community and those who are coming out of prison, that they find a life that is free from unjust acts. I think I can say that. God, in your grace. I'm Ron. I waited just long enough to make sure that Ron had to walk all the way across the room. Good. Good. Um, uh, along with uh, OPOP, we have been involved with Hagar's Community Church. Hagar's has been uh, locked out of the women's prison for about eight months, and yesterday we received the first concrete indication that we'll be able to resume worship awesome. um, in February. 
uh, Hagar's Community Church was indeed before the pandemic a community um, within a rather gruesome environment, but it was a community that grew from a seed um, and blossomed and now um, it's going to be starting over in a, in a realistic sense. So prayers for um, new growth, for rejuvenation um, among the women of Hagar's Community Church. Well said. God, in your grace. I'm Kay, and I think what I want us to pray for is wisdom. Um, I am aware of, and in our prayers, so much balances on decisions that are made and decisions that we need to make, decisions for what's next. Um, and so many of what we've already prayed about has to do with decisions that have been made or that need to be made. And I just ask that that God bless us with a certain measure of wisdom and guidance as we look forward to decisions that we each individually have to make, that we have to make as a country, our lawmakers, our governing bodies. Um, it, there seems to be kind of a lack of wisdom in some of those areas. And so I just ask that, that uh, God maybe give us an extra dose of wisdom, um, both individually and collectively. God, in your grace. Lord God, we offer our prayers in silence from the depths of our hearts. We know that you listen, so give us pause to remember. God, in your grace, we pray together to our parenting God, mother and father, as Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom and the power and the glory for amen today we have an opportunity to give financially to the work of christ through this church we love god and want to share that love with others recognizing that we often give in ways other than financial we invite you to fill out an offering slip found in the chair pockets with gifts of time and talent that you gave this week and place them in the plate as well. We'll display them here under the cross and the symbol of how we follow Christ in our self-giving love. So let's celebrate all the gifts that make us the body of Christ and enjoy an offertory from our church musician, Noel.
always be foolish enough to offer our gifts to you, generous God. For you use them to bring justice to the oppressed, to bring laughter to those who mourn, and to offer wonder to little children. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to sing our sending hymn number 643, Now Thank We All Our God. and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace as you walk through these doors seeking justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with your God. Amen. You may take your seat and listen. You're amazing. Thank you for sharing your gift. Just thought I'd say that.
Go in peace.